<laughs> great. 4.30. Um, wow. So great to be here at the Open Source Summit Europe. Um, I almost uh, missed, uh, missed it. Uh, there were stor heavy storms up north and uh, my plane got delayed and initially sort of my layover would be missed. But then the layover was delayed as well, so I ran for it and uh, here I am. Uh, it's especially nice to see that so many are sticking around for the last session, even though it's so fun, sun, sunny outside and uh, there is party afterwards. Uh, so um, I hope you will definitely enjoy <laughs> this last session here. So uh, my name is Hans Christian. Um, I work for the Norwegian government, more specifically the Labor and Welfare Administration, or NAV for short, and I'll get back to what NAV is. So I've been a part of the open source um, community for as long as I can remember. I started back in the golden days of Apache web server and PHP CMS systems. Uh, I still remember that we had our own source code hosting before we moved to Subversion. <laughs> uh, Git was not a not a, still not a thing at that point. Fast forward a decade and I became part of the what's today known as the Node.js Foundation, uh, when we for forked Node, created IOJS, and instituted an open governance model. What a time. And now I get to code in the open full time as a part of my job at the Norwegian government, mostly in Go, playing CNCF Go, where you try to catch as many CNCF projects you can while building a developer platform. <laughs> so my team is responsible for the application platform at uh, that all the teams at NAV develop their application on top of. And in many ways, it was what sparked what I will be talking about here today. How we are building an open government, government with open code and open source. So first, for those of you uh, not from Europe, uh, sort of, what is this Norwegian government and uh, welfare and labor? Um, sort of, it's part of what's called the Nordic model, uh, it's a socionomic and political system and commonly associated with the Nordic countries. Uh, my infographic here is a little bit wrong. We are missing Denmark and we are missing Iceland in addition to Norway and Sweden and Finland. Um, and there is no s sort of single agreed upon definition, but it sort of is um, characterized by these six pillars here. So a very strong focus on social welfare uh, with free um, universal health care and, and sort of a safety net for all um, that live in, in the country. Um, income, dis dis income distribution and sort of progressive tax, tax, taxing, uh, tax model. Labor market flexibility and strong workers' rights where you sort of, you cannot be f just fired with no cause on the day. Um, strong gender equality, which sort of uh, the Labor and Welfare Administration also provide support to, to uh, with their uh, welfare benefits there as well as sort of free education. So more specifically, what is uh, NAV? So NAV's mission is to contribute to people's social and economic security and to promote the transition to work with the goal of creating an inclusive society with equal opportunities. And the word NAV means spoke, as the spoke in the wheel, because it's a central hub that makes the Norwegian society go around. And we often say that we help through all phases of life, all the way from the start with child support, parental benefits, sickness benefits, unemployment benefits, as well as pensions. pensions. So literally from cradle, uh, from cradle to grave. And just to sort of set it a little bit into perspective of what we are talking about here. So we still have code from the 1970s running in production today. Um, we, uh, <laughs> and without revealing too much, that's almost twice my age. Um, I wonder if my Kubernetes clusters are going to run for that long. At some point, I really don't hope. <laughs> We also manage one third of the national, national budget of Norway through our welfare schemes. We have 20,000 employees, about 800 developers, at least those that have account on GitHub, which includes our consultants. And we just crossed the 2,000 
public GitHub repositories mark before this summer. So just to sort of get the scale of these operations, it's by no means sm a small operation, at least not in a Norwegian scale. So before we continue, a, sort of a personal story of mine. Um, so I became a parent for the first time in, back in 2014. And it's the most wonderful and the most stressful thing in your life for those who are parents. Um, and we have some truly great ben parental benefits here in Norway, um, where the parents get close to a year, full year of paid time off that they can divide between their parents according to some rules. And when I say some rules, I mean quite a lot of rules. <laughs> so this was what sort of faced me. Um, and uh, it was this form here that you had to print out, you had to fill out. Uh, it didn't really offer much of an explanation. And if I don't rem recall correctly, uh, I think I got it in return at least once because I filled it out correctly. So not the best user journey, uh, one would say. Uh, fast forward to 2021, uh, I became a parent for the third time. Um, and to my surprise, sort of this form that you had to print out, that was completely gone. Now you just logged on with your personal ID and a sort of a national uh, logon system for all um, services in Norway. And you were prompted with congratulations, here are your parental benefits, how would you like to set up your parental leave? And we, we could then fill out this form together and the button that sort of was sort of submit, it became green once everything was in order and you got sort of real <laughs> error message back and sort of said that, oh, this needs to be so and so. So a much larger, a much better user experience and it sort of sums up a little bit why I'm here today um, because this is, um, there's been a lot of great work going on in the Norwegian government for the past years. But if we then go back again, uh, not so long ago, um, that wasn't the case. It was with the, with, with, back with the paper forms that you had to print out. Then now I've looked something like this on a sort of a very, very high level. You have stakeholders in one part of the organization and then you had IT as another part of the organization. Um, typically had uh, sort of architects and manager, pro uh, project managers, and then they made sort of uh, very, very detailed specification of what's needed to, to be built, and then they shipped those to contractors um, that were, were the ones that were building the systems. And as you can all imagine, this was very costly, very costly for the Norwegian state. It was also painstakingly slow, uh, this process here. It was very error prone. So not only did it take long time, there it didn't result in any good uh, product at the end. Um, and as you can imagine, there was a very, very low engagement. People didn't really feel that this was a thriving place to work when the system was this sort of uh, set up this way here. And in many ways sort of uh, this is from the Phoenix project. Uh, may, maybe it's modeled of our, <laughs> from what NAV looked back in the days, I don't know. But this sort of sums, also sums up how, um, how NAV and uh, I, I would guess a lot of the public sector and large organization uh, would look like. And then something changed. So this is a graph of um, average weekly deploys to production per year. So until 2015, you typically had quarterly releases where everyone would get into the office and you typically, I can imagine sort of a line where people like having their newly baked system comp freshly compiled and sort of like, can I put this into production please? And if someone before you failed, then the rest had to go home because then the IT would, or the operations people rather, would have to clean that up, revert back and it just, um, didn't, didn't offer that sort of agile, continuous delivery as we might, maybe we are used to it today. So something clearly happened. What, was, what happened? Well, in 2015, we got a new welfare director and we also got a new head of IT, IT director. 
And first order of business was actually to then employ developers. Up until that point, there were no developers hired in that part of the Norwegian government. Um, we, we can see we get a little bit of bump in the deployment frequency. In 2018, we started open sourcing uh, our work. And from there, you can see that the um, weekly deploys just started climbing and climbing and actually reached an all-time high during the pandemic or a little bit after the pandemic. And then it went down. Uh, I think we can see some that we have reached that plateau there. That's the means of going, putting something into production isn't really what's holding our, us back anymore. So what was really sort of the reason behind this and where am I going with all of this? Well, it's this product team. We, what also happened with the sort of influx of newly hired developers was that we reorganized how we were actually structured. So instead of having this very tedious pipeline or factory, we sort of drew up the map again and divided all of the domains and put people into those domains. So you, for instance, here is a team that's responsible for parental benefit. The team doesn't really need to concern themselves about unemployment benefit or pensions or anything else. They only need to concern themselves about parental benefit, understanding the domain, understanding the users, and then being as creative as possible and delivering the best service within that domain. And so what happened when they, and then because they were really given a very free realm, they were giving as much autonomy as they could within their domain. Of course, keeping within sort of, this is, these are the laws and regulations for this particular, particular welfare service. So what happened? Well, as you can imagine, they took decisions and suddenly we saw a huge influx of open source tools and technologies being introduced to our organization. <clears throat> Um, because this was tools that they really they had tried uh, personally, they had used in prior jobs, and which they really felt that this is solving a problem for my team. And what else um, happened? Then GitHub happened uh, because they didn't really like the experience that we were having in our previous source code uh, repository, and um, <laughs> they were really at that point, no, no better alternative um, that they could uh, find uh, easily, get, that were easily available. Um, and then they started opening all the repos. <laughs> so everyone, everything was suddenly sort of, oh, this is public, this is public, this. And it was a little bit chaotic uh, and uh, anarchy at that point. Um, so we had to take a step back at that point um, because there were no internal policies. Um, there were this accidental publishing of things that could contain sensitive information, passwords, certificates, or internal information that isn't really what we were supposed to happen. So guidelines were clearly needed. Uh, we couldn't really say that, oh, it's free for all without any, uh, anything to, to sort of guide them. So we created um, our open code guidelines, uh, open, of course, they are open in our GitHub account um, from day one. Uh, it's written in Norwegian though, um, fair warning, um, but sort of explained the motivation behind why are we doing this? What's the benefit to NAV of having coding in the open? And what are the requirements from the developer's perspective? What are the requirements on them? And what should they do and what shouldn't they do when it comes to opening their repositories? Because why would we do such a thing? Well, we believe that since we are funded by the public, the code that we create should be available to the public. Um, we should be open and transparent. What are we doing with the money and how are we um, making sure that your rights as a Norwegian citizen are taken care of in a good way. That when you apply for parental benefits, that the systems that will automate and handle that for you um, is actually written in such a way that it does what it should be and it's up to the standards that you should expect as a citizen. 
We also feel that this is being sort of one of the largest, largest, largest consumers of open source, at least in, Nor in, in Norway. It's important that we contribute back, that this code here, if it can be reused, if there's some re reusability, that it should be reused there, that we shouldn't reinvent the wheel over and over again, especially in the, within the public sector. We also thought that um, having the code open would make the developers think a little bit more about quality, that not taking too many shortcuts because people will actually look uh, at the code. You cannot be completely missing unit tests. You cannot have bad, horrible coding practices. You need to think a little bit more. You need to be a little bit more conscious and not thinking that no one will ever see this <laughs> because at this point they will. Um, and we actually see that that has that sort of um, uh, thinking about it uh, actually makes uh, our developers write better code. And we also saw that, or thought at that point, that this was a good way to attract talent, that um, this would uh, make NAV more visible and would also be more fun and more engaging for our developers if they were able to uh, showcase what they are working, so having some pride in their work. So, Luckily, we were not alone in this um, sort of doing this. So a huge shout out to um, gov.uk that's sort of been sort of a beacon in this here, this process and very, very early on uh, wrote about the benefits of uh, coding in the open and why it would, was great for a security perspective as well. And um, sort of uh, embracing open source and really encouraging open code within the public sector. So, um, in 2020, we actually changed our uh, policy and said that now it's open by default. Up until that point, it was very sort of in these cases here, now it should be the default. We had such a great experience um, with very, very little challenges after we introduced the policies. And then we, but we instituted, there are three exceptions to the rules. If your repository contains keys or any other identifiable information that might be test data or something like that, it's an immediate no-go, of course. If it's uh, fraud detection algorithms, we tend to not be open sourcing, <laughs> putting those public. And also if it contained unimplemented regulations. So at some point there might be sort of discussions and we would see how would the code, how would the system be coded in order to sort of fulfill this regulation here? And we wouldn't really like to publish something that isn't published. It's not <laughs> been made into law. But at the end of the day, the teams had the final say. So it goes into their autonomy that they had the final say when it comes to open sourcing their repository. And sort of this has been our OSPO, um, believe it or not. It's this... Uh, open source uh, Slack channel, and we don't at NAV have any, anyone that's sort of full-time or <laughs> sort of has an official capacity. It's sort of, um, I wouldn't say volunteer-based because we are employed <laughs> by the government, but sort of the, the engagement into sort of the open source community, it's a community effort. And sort of people that have engagement and sort of have enthusiasm and sort of feel that this, feel strongly about it. And for the most part, it's just keep ticking along and people will have some questions, there will be answers, and sort of we have this community inside our organization regarding open source. So we do have some success stories to, to share as well. Uh, I will be sharing four of them. There are probably more that I haven't heard about. Um, so the first one is NICE. Um, and it's the team that I work on as well, that's why I put it first. <laughs> so it's our internal developer platform. Um, it's made to sort of make our teams as autonomous and be able to take full responsible of their application. So from development, deployment, and all the way through production and to the end of life of that application. It's not handing it over to a production team anymore. It's based on Kubernetes and sort of where incep the inception of the NICE platform was re shortly after Kubernetes was open sourced as well. 
it runs across our on-premise on environments and our cloud environment as well, and sort of provides this unified layer, so then very, very few differences from the developer point of view, running their application either on-premise or in our cloud environments. And by this point, we have close to 2,000 applications or services running on our platform. And sort of a recent survey uh, said that 97% of our teams have one, at least one application in the um, NICE platform. So we have a really, really broad sort of um, uh, adoption, but it's still optional. There is no requirement that you have to use this platform here. It's sort of autonomous all the way. Um, of course, then, if you chose to you use something else and, and for that matter run it yourself. There are so much that you need to think of that the teams tend to choose the easiest path and then is, that is to use the platform. So for those of you familiar with Kubernetes, the platform looks like this. It's pro mainly providing a CRD for the developers. So this is what we call a nice manifest. So for those of you familiar with Kubernetes, it should look fairly, uh, fairly familiar. And then we have different operators in our Kubernetes cluster that sort of does separate things. So we don't have everything in one operator. It's sort of dispatching more resources as you sort of enable different features of the platform. And this is what I've meant with the CNC of Go. <laughs> sort of this is, um, so that it, it's building on the shoulder of giants. It's of course building on Kubernetes and it's building on top of a lot of open source. These are just the CNCF project uh, uh, that we are using. We're using a lot of other um, open source products uh, and technologies that sort of deserves mentions, but I only had that much time. So these are the ones that sort of got place in this slide. So if you remember this graph here that I showed you earlier, there's an empty spot between 2016 and 2018. And guess what? That is where the platform, so it sort of plays into this role and sort of been one of the key pillars why we have this sort of, um, why we have autonomous teams and why we have such high velocity in our teams as well. So, and this wasn't possible without open source. There's no one, no one arguing that. We could never have built what we have today without the help of open source. And, but it goes um, larger than just the welfare and labor administration. It's sort of outside now as well. We have collaboration with the tax authority, the Norwegian police, Statistics Norway, Mapping Authority, Food Safety Authority. And these are just a few um, that we have very, very close collaboration with. So you are already seeing that there are this Across the, across the public, across the government collaboration here and stop reinventing the wheel in every single uh, authority or part, part of the government, but rather starting to share and starting to collaborate. And this was actually so successful that we have created um, sort of a grassroots community called Public Pass Norway, or Offentlig Pass as we call it in Norway. Um, so this is just a, it's a volunteer community but we have uh, at least 40, um, 40 sort of member organization as of today. And it was basically NAV and the tax authority that met during KubeCon 2017 and sort of saw and talked with, the, with one another and that we are building the same thing. We should, we should talk. <laughs> we, should, <laughs> we should collaborate and see that uh, or find out how we can actually share information, share knowledge, and then they just invited their friends and by word of mouth, the sort of the uh, community spread. And the picture below there are sort of the Norwegian delegates on Cube, last year's KubeCon EU, and then the other pictures there are from our last meetup that was last week actually uh, in the Offentlig Pass uh, community. And just really, really nice. And I got uh, asked them, and these are the word cloud here is Norwegian, unfortunately. But I asked them, what is the sort of what's the the main takeaway? What's the why do we have this? And what's your sort of uh, the, the what comes to mind when we have this uh, public pass? And they said the sharing and learning and collaboration um, in all the different types of words there, and that is so really key. And I sort of believe that that's key to open source as well, this community that we are all part of. 
And I did sort of try to count up uh, with good help of uh, one of my colleagues that made a repository with a list. And these are actually all of the Norwegian government organization with a public presence on GitHub. So you actually see that there are quite a number of, and these are almost all of them are part of this public pass. And we believe that we at least take some credit that they are using uh, open source to that extent because of that community. So we are really, really happy and it's going really, really strong and it's an important part of our collaboration. But there's more. Another network started a little bit after the Offendly Pass, or quite recently actually, was that we had sort of in this um, uh, spirit of sharing and being open uh, within our company, within NAV, we created this uh, security champions that sort of all teams were uh, not uh, required, but they were encouraged to have a security champion and we hosted internal meetups and really sort of boosted that and, and sort of uh, made it really awesome to have that role on your team. And then we were of course sharing outside of our organization that, yeah, we are doing this and we're having so much fun and the teams are on board and really starting to focus on security. And then again, so someone from NAV talked with someone from one, some other organization and they just said that we need to create a Norwegian network. And this was larger than just the public sector. This is across all of Norway. And at this point, they have close to 2,000 individ 2, individual members in their Slack community, and they have had six meetups so far, and sort of this security champion. And it's a really, created a really, really buzz in the Norwegian security community. So that's really, really cool as well. A little bit more sort of concrete and not, community, not that much community oriented is Axel. So you can see there's a common theme. We have the hub and we have the axle. <laughs> um, this is our internal product development toolbox, but sort of keeping with our spirit of being public, being open, this is open as well. It's a public Git repository uh, where we document our best practice uh, making with product development as well as our design system. And this has also been a really, really huge success in Norway where we, ha where we have collaboration with other, other government agen agencies uh, to share components, share uh, icons and, and collaborate uh, through this. It's actually been so successful that the sort of the digitalization agency of Norway, they have then decided that, yes, we, we need to make this. And they have made sort of a common design system for all of Norway. So now we have this public design system here that's supposed to sort of all organizations can use and sort of collaborate uh, with. So they don't need to reinvent a, des a design system from scratch over and over again. And then there are more things that should deserve their own. We have different repos repository within our sort of organization that has some traction every now and then. There will be a tweet that, oh, I just found that this, this exists the Labor and Welfare Administration already made it, so I could just reuse it, and that's, that's really, really great. Mm. And then there was this report that was sort of published, I don't know if it was published today, or it was at least it was highlighted in the keynote uh, this morning. And sort of, it's a little bit contrast, uh, I feel, uh, that sort of they said that the public sector was lagging behind, well, at least not in Norway, <laughs> at least not in my opinion. <laughs> we are really, really forward leaning and um, we hope to sort of be showcasing what we are doing and sort of being an example for other public agencies, other governments across the world to sort of, yes, you can do this. Um, Norway has done it and then so can you. <laughs> and we very, very recently, we signed the um, FSSF, uh, Free Software Foundation Europe, they have a, um, uh, a, a, not a project, but a call to public money, public code, a sort of call to organization that, uh, uh, code that's funded by the, by the people should be available to the people. We signed that, so we are, we are sort of a signatory there. 
Uh, we just recently, just a couple of weeks ago, we became a member of the Linux Foundation, and I'm really, really proud that we are sort of we are stepping up our game or, uh, on the sort of the bro broader scene as well, not only inside Norway. And then, sort of, you might be wondering, sort of, was was it all this easy as sort of Indiana Jones made, made it look in Riders of the Lo uh, Lost Ark? No, of course it was, wasn't. <laughs> There's always uh, sort of controversies that we had to tackle along the way, sort of uh, open source is insecure, uh, public code makes us vulnerable, nobody cares that we, it's private, public or private, our code isn't reusable enough, uh, what about commercial support? And sort of all of these are rooted in sort of uh, concerns, the, the well, uh, they they def definitely deserve sort of being taken seriously. I'm not sort of saying that this is, these are uh, not uh, sort of real concerns, but what we have found is that none of them have actually turned out to be a problem. Sort of yes, um, if if we do it incorrectly and we, if we do it without any guidelines, as we sort of started with, <laughs> then we have a huge challenge. Um, but with the guidelines that we have, we have found that this actually. Um, the, our public repo, uh, repositories actually has fewer vulnerabilities compared to their closed source counterparts. We have, we have metrics for all of our repositories, <laughs> thanks to GitHub, and we can actually see a clear difference between the public repositories and the private repositories when it comes to responsibility of keeping their dependencies patched and up to date, and the, the code that they write as well. And we clearly see that people care. We got of course, everything we make isn't sort of, we, we don't have any natural competitors. There are no one that's going to make a new labor and welfare administration. So it's not necessarily reusable out of the box, but very mu much of our components are reusable. And we see that they are starting to being reused as well. <clears throat> but again, not everything is open yet. Uh, not everything will be open. Uh, that's just the way it is. It takes time and it takes, so, to some degree, it takes infinite time. Um, and this is just a sort of brief, informal survey that we did with our, uh, or some, um, a team member of mine did with our, with the private repositories. Why hadn't they, what, what was the reason why they haven't, haven't turned the switch and, and sort of made their repository public? And a lot of people just hadn't really uh, didn't know that we had a sort of an open source policy, so that's on us to sort of communicate that. Uh, a lot of them didn't have the time, uh, and that's understandable. There is features and there is things to do all, all the time, and you do have to make sure that the repository can be opened. Um, we actually have that as a requirement. Um, some of the ex sort of responses was that we have too many vulnerabilities, and that's sort of that's maybe something that you should tackle regardless of it being public or private. You just forgot, it's still under development. It contains sensitive test data, so not everything is, is of a modern date where we have synthetic test data. Um, and some of them are just to, to be retired. Uh, and that, of course, takes infinite time before they are eventually turned off. So this, this is just a fact of life and uh, something that we have to deal with uh, or be aware of. So we are wrapping up now um, and getting ready to go out in the sunlight. So NOV today can sort of be summarized in this, these four uh, highlights here. It's team autonomy first, the team first. That's the most, that's what we are gearing towards and sort of making sure that they have what they need of, with regards to tooling and with regards to autonomy. And then it says sharing is caring. A lot, this culture of sharing internally when teams make decisions, they are more or less obliged to share that with their fellow teams. So when they sort of decide to use something, they must then share it with others, their experience. So people or other teams can sort of take an informed decision whether or not to follow there. And we see that for the most part, it sort of follows some, someone will lead by an example and then the other will follow in that direction. And then having the right tool is really, really important for teams and not having frictions in their day-to-day -day life and having tools that fit, is fit for purpose. And then we have this 
policy that I'm really, really proud about, that we, have, we are open by default. And that also means that when we are considering new technologies and new tools, etc., we are looking for the open source alternative first. If not, we are op looking at open standards and maybe a proprietary implementation. And only sort of lastly will we sort of consider closed source proprietary all the way. And there are some cases where that is sort of the right decision, but at least it needs to be an informed decision and it needs to be made in that direction. And then we see that actually, um, since we started opening up, this has been really, really good for us in many ways. So this is sort of a survey um, done by Universum, and sort of the lower score is better, it's how they rank. Um, so you can actually see that we have gone down or up, <laughs> depending on how you would uh, score it, <laughs> better, better ranking. Sort of, of course, we go a little bit up and down, but in a general sense, over there, at least as long as I could find data, we have sort of moved in the right direction. Be and, and the fact is that, at least in Norway, it's a really, really competitive market. And since we have this universal healthcare and such great benefits, that's it, that is not something that sort of we have exclusive right as a public government employee. That is just how it is. You have a job safety, regardless if you are a public employee or a private employee. Um, so it's really, really competitive. But being open source have made us really visible. Being open and being allowed to share and being allowed to talk what we are doing and being sort of a in conferences like the Open Source Summit and sharing our experience actually gets results. And this year we had a 2x increase in applicants um, and we have had a record of 600 applicants for developer related positions uh, that were open this year. And we, in, in a general sense, without me having too much data to back it up, we see a good trend of employee satisfaction. We, at least the, 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 the developers that I interface with, that I talk with on a daily basis, they are, for the most part, really, really happy with what we are providing them and the sort of the work environment there. But it doesn't really stop us from sort of pushing on to uh, sort of continue um, being better and continue this work. So we, of course, we will continue being open and sort of opening more and more and making sure that what is sort of, uh, what can be open is open. Um, but there are areas that we would really, really like to see, or at least me personally would like to see us improve upon, and that's sort of participating upstream, being an even more responsible open source citizen. As I said, sort of we consume a tremendous lot of, of open source, and us being sort of good open source citizen, and interacting and engaging with the various project is really, really important for their sustainability and for us to be sort of a, a good open source citizen. And then I would really like just to see that continue growing these communities that we alre already have, have going and sort of continuing that trend. And as that we are even better on showcasing the open source technologies that we are using and that we are making as well as seeing if we can find ways to actually fund open source projects as well. And that's particularly challenging in the public sector, but sort of I really, really believe that it's possible and it's worth investigating and worth sort of following up on. So with that, I am concluding my presentation and I believe that we have some minutes before we are done. So if there are any questions, feel free to ask them. If not, I will be at the party and being here all the days of the Open Source Summit, so feel free to hit me up. Yeah? Uh, you said that you can have open source for improving uh, some regulations, but I'm not uh, implemented yet. Do you think we're in a time of, what is the slide implemented, right? Yeah, so, yes. yes, exactly. So In some cases, we might have sort of an advance notice that this regulation here will be passed, and then at that point, we sort of uh, will tend to not be as public as we would normally be. Uh, but this on the upside means like you get the first notice that there will be a law, and uh, you are not sure about it. it's like this, but uh, and like that. But you already start implementing, so that you don't have to start implementing when the law is out, right? 
yeah, you know, faster. In, in, in some cases, we, we will try to be as sort of proactive as possible. So it comes down to the individual teams, whether or not they have the advance notice and whether or not they have time to actually start working on that. But yeah, if we, if we can, we will be as proactive as, as we can to sort of be ahead of the curve and sort of hit, be, um, deploy the new version once the sort of the regulation is actually published. Nice. So what I'm wondering is, the software is being open sourced. Is it also open for contributions from outsiders? Yes, it is. So I, I don't know if we are, how good we are and actually having contributor guidelines. And that is also something I, I would like us to be even better. But we do have had some uh, contributions in the past, but they are at least, well, you, you, need, to have, you need to differ between sort of this is just uh, an app and, and part of a service. Those typically don't get any contributions. They're very rarely that you find the highly motivated. You might find highly motivated citizens and then, oh, I spotted this CSS bug and I can actually go in and then fix the pull request. There has happened that type of contributions. And then we have all of these other parts that are sort of building blocks, a little bit lower level, it's the design system, it's the components that builds up our platform, and et cetera. Those have outside contributions, and we are very, very happy, and we are um, actively trying to have more of a community around those. Thanks. Hey, I would assume that as, as a government agency, or as a bunch of government agencies, you have services that are really important for society to actually function in a way. And uh, I was wondering, um, does anyone look at this from like a broader national security perspective in terms of delivering these services and what would happen if like an antagonistic state actor would actually target you uh, through these, uh, these repositories? Yeah, ab absolutely. And we have uh, huge teams and departments that sort of are focused on exactly what you're saying there. So uh, often it comes down to sort of, how do we have disaster recovery mechanisms? Are we, and are we keeping the citizens' data secure and sort of being sort of a, a good uh, steward of that data? So it comes down to sort of data locality often. Um, on the open, s of the code itself, it's quite a universal, at least, uh, or quite sort of broad acceptance that the source code um, isn't sensitive. That is not where the security are in, in the code itself. Uh, and that we are, we, the, there are, of course, pros and cons ha, ha, being public and being open about it, but that the, the being open, the, the positive effect of that is greater than the potential downside. And um, uh, so, so in large degree, and then we have other mitigating actions to sort of make sure that we, we find vulnerabilities and sort of are ahead of the curve there as well. So, um, yeah, it's, it, it is a, a challenge, um, but sort of not, not being, not the code itself. Um, and that the, there are so many systems that needs to have access to the source code. So it will be public or not, or it will be, it will sort of, it's, a, it's sort of just, waiting to happen for the source code to, to leak or someone to get their hands on it. So it's, that, that shouldn't be the mechanism that stops any bad guys from. I was more, I was more thinking of, of like directed attacks towards you, like uh, supply chain. Mm. Uh, supply yeah, chain. So, so supply chain security is something that we are very, very keen on and sort of we're very, uh, sort of something that we have spending a lot of time is the SLSA uh, supply chain uh, security measurements of signing, of uh, providing and consuming uh, software bill of materials, SBOM. So um, definitely something that we have high on our mind there. And sort of, uh, as I sort of alluded to, sort of we see that our public repositories, uh, the, the teams that have public repositories are much more sort of aware of these challenges there and are much quicker to actually get their dependencies patched and up to date. So of course there will be, there are adversaries. Um, we aren't the sort of the, while, while it will sort of, it, it has potential 
uh, to disrupt and sort of be have have negative consequences. It's uh, certainly not life and death uh, situa situations that we are sort of that's our that those aren't the worst case scenario uh, scenario. And also we see that sort of from a larger government perspective or, or sort of national security perspective, there are other higher value targets um, in, due to our sort of uh, contingency me measure, measures, we are able to pay out most of the welfare services regardless or not if our environments are sort of online. Do you have any interaction with your counterparts from any other European countries or maybe you know, or so, cities or mm, public administrations? Mm, uh, sort of not me personally at least. And we, I would really like us to have more interactions. Uh, so if there are any, <laughs> please approach me. Um, I know that there are on higher sort of higher political levels, uh, but not too much on the on a code level. Uh, no. You do not sh you do not share codes between countries for something that can be reusable in another country. Well, it's it's all open source. It's okay. MIT license. So if anyone wants to use it, it's completely. And you are not using something from another country. Hmm? You are not using something published by uh, another country, for example. Not that yes. I can. Uh, not not sort of public code. We are using. We have we have API integrations maybe, uh, but but uh, I can't sort of recall that we oh we are using this component here. Uh, we might do because sort of. Uh, the teams have the final say, the autonomy of what packages they are providing. So if they are pulling in a React component from the French government, that's, that's sort of out of my, <laughs> I don't have the visibility into that. <laughs> hmm. Hello, uh, first of all, uh, thanks for, for your talk. Uh, you just answered my question. I was, uh, I was wondering what type of licensing are you using in your public repositories, mm. but you just mentioned that it is MIT. Yeah. It's Why cool. MIT and not other uh, restrictive <laughs> license for yeah. governmental? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Code. So um, there's sort of a wrong answer and a right answer, depending on, on what you think. Sort of uh, my personal belief, I wasn't there when sort of all of those decisions were made, but I, I can imagine that since most of this grew out of the team that created the Kubernetes platform, and since Kubernetes is licensed under MIT, I can assume that they sort of, this works for Kubernetes. It's the whole ecosystem here. We are building components for the Kubernetes ecosystem. It's, why shouldn't they be MIT licensed? It seems those are at least <laughs> compatible. Um, and then, of course, there are this broader uh, sort of discu discussion sort of regarding copyleft licenses, permissive versus restrictive licenses. And personally, I believe that sort of being as liberal as you can be with regards to your licensing, that's sort of, then, then there is a lot, most reuse possible. We don't really care if there's a commercial, it doesn't hurt us if someone uh, gains anything uh, monetarily or for whatever reason on the code. Of course, we would really not like it to see it being used against the humanity and, and so forth, but sort of from a commercial perspective, it doesn't hurt us. <laughs> so, long, so that's just a neutral. So the more people that can uh, use it, the better uh, in, in my sense. Um, yeah. And um, I had that Kind of two questions. One is about governance. If you have any kind of a governance model in place to make sure the open will stay open by default from a government perspective. And the second is how do you involve the citizens on, in the code or if there's any kind of a programs to make sure citizens are involved? So I didn't quite catch the last part, but I can answer, answer the first one uh, first. So um, it's sort of, um, it's, it's basically mostly word of mouth. Um, there is this trade-off, should we invest a lot of time and effort uh, sort of staffing up an open source um, office, or should it mainly be sort of a grassroots movement and that we accept that there will be 
in this case here, there will be teams that doesn't really follow the sort of the standards that we are laid out. And we have opted for the, the latter because we feel that we, uh, the, while there is certainly benefit for us have it being open, it's sort of, it's only a benefit until a certain extent. We can only put this much effort into it before we, it starts sort of being a conflict of, of interest of, of is spending more time and resources on being open than we are gaining in the other end there. So that's sort of, but with that, there is, there is this very self-awareness from the developer's perspective. They are quite aware about what their fellow teams are doing with regards to technology decisions, with regards to being open or not. And most developers really like that this is public on their GitHub profile. Most of them are using their one account. Some are using sort of, oh, I want to have my work account for my work and I want to have my personal account for my personal thing. That's totally fine. But most of them only have one account and sort of treat that as my CV of some sort and really like and really and if they can um, have a repository public, they will have more to show on their profile there and more to gain on a, on a personal level. So that's sort of the first part there. Yeah. Go ahead. The second part was about how do you involve as a, the citizens as contributors to make sure the code will keep in the hands of the citizens. Yeah. Um, we, do, we don't. We don't have sort of that. I would really like us to have more involvement there. And I really look at sort of like the OpenStreetMap community where you have this very community driven. Uh, I really is believe there's a sort of room for what I would call digital volunteer work. And that sort of, if, if you find that, oh, my, this, this service over here, it's subpar, it's using not my favorite uh, uh, sort of web uh, framework or uh, but more seriously, sort of, it has some bugs, it has some, something isn't right here. Um, we really would like there to be sort of concerned and responsible citizens that then we're allowed to sort of, and, and could, could, do, could go into the code and sort of change it. So I would really like you to see that there was sort of this edit button <laughs> in at nav.anno. Um, I'm not sure what the different stakeholders would feel. I think for the most part, they will say that this is confusing to the users uh, because 99.9999 users uh, doesn't really care. Uh, and it's not really meant for them. It's meant for those that, oh, I'm really interesting. How did nav uh, go about um, uh, sort of providing me this service here. They had some automated decision making. How was that process done? Can I actually see what is actually going on under the hood here to make sure that my rights are being uh, preserved as they should? Um, so there's no, not an easy answer to there. I believe that sort of being, being public, being open about it, that yes, the code is there if you if you have some questions, if you have, want to sort of participate uh, or look at it, it's uh, all there. Uh, just do that. Um, so again, so sort of it comes a little bit back to the first question as well, sort of how much time and effort can we sort of um, set aside uh, doing that outreach there before sort of it hinders the, the actual sort of delivering the welfare services that we are set to, to be delivering them. Hmm. But with that said, I really would like there to be more pull requests from <laughs> individuals and to these uh, applications, to the services themselves, and not only the, the sort of the components. I think we are out of time, uh, so I will respect everyone sort of want to go outside and I will not hold you back. So thank you so much for being here.